Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming to this Friday symposium focused on NDS. During the next minutes, we are going to try to explore and market territory in myelodysplastic syndromes. Remember that this is an activity preceding the next AS meeting. Here you can see your welcome. It's a pleasure for me to share this uh, meeting with my co-panelists, uh, Dr. Rory Salis from New Haven, Connecticut, and also Dr. Aditi Sastri from New York, and Maria Diaz Campello from uh, Salamanca in Spain. Well, let's start with a, a small review because uh, in the last uh, years, we have a lot of the, uh, recent development that are changing the NDS care, and uh, we have to incorporate all in the uh, manage of our uh, patients. As all you know, several drugs has been approved for the treatment of NDS. The first approval in these years came from Los Patterson in 2020 for patients requiring transfusions with the ring sideroblast phenotype and uh, in the presence of uh, uh, in the lower risk setting. And recently, Luz Patterson has also obtained another approval in, in first-line treatment based on the results of the COMMANDS trial, comparing with the ESAs, uh, the benefits in patients with transfusion dependency reach this goal of FDA approval. And we have uh, this drug in two different settings, first-line treatment and also second-line treatment for patients with low risk NDS and requiring transfusion. Another goal in treatment is uh, the goal of hypomethylating oral agents. And you can see here that this novel compound, sedasuridine plus desitabine, has also been approved in 2020 uh, by FDA for all the subtypes of uh, NDS. And a novel uh, drug uh, based on target therapy has been recently approved in by FDA and is uh, for patients with mutant EDH1 uh, isoforms, and ibocitinib is also approved in this uh, setting for NDS patients. So we are going to review, of course, all these novel drugs uh, and how we can manage is, this during this presentation, and of course, a novel other mechanism of action, a novel other uh, new novel drugs that are currently ongoing in clinical trials. And of course, during these uh, last uh, years, we have uh, developed the new novel uh, classification for MDS and a new uh, prognostication index, including the molecular profile of these patients. This is IP IPSSM, and we are going to review the issues with this uh, molecular uh, prognostic index in order to try to improve the MS MDS care nowadays. Even that uh, we have all these recent advances in the nowadays, we have uh, that there is a clear need for a better risk adapt uh, treatment. And as you can see here in this slide in which uh, we review the registry data for uh, uh, treatment management in patients within the United States, presented two years ago in the AS meeting, we confirm that uh, even in this cohort of more than 500 patients, in including patients with lower recent NDS, the majority of this, uh, these patients were diagnosed with moderate to severe anemia, symptomatic anemia, but they generally did not receive any treatment. The majority of them received only supporting care. And this is a, a, a bad option generally for the patient because when the patient becomes symptomatic, we need to increase quality of life, trying to increase hemoglobin level with, uh, with a different treatments and trying to avoid transfusion because transfusions are going not only to decrease quality of life, but also are going to be associated to a, with poor outcomes due to the iron overload and, and the risk associated to this uh, adverse feature. So we clearly recommend it always to try to treat the patients as soon as the anemia starts to be, to, to be symptomatic. Because all you know, you not need to, to know that the majority of the patients within the lower risk setting are not going to die due to AML evolution or due to high risk MDS evolution. They are going to die uh, due to the complications of site opinions and the majority of these uh, complications are related to iron overload and cardiac uh, events. 
Here you can see the impact of uh, the transfusion dependency in patients with lower risk in this setting. And as you can see in these two figures that uh, are very different regarding the times, uh, the impact of transfusion in the dependency on patients uh, is tremendous. And we have to try to improve these results, trying to keep the patient again in a, to a transfusion independent phase of the disease. And for this uh, situation, we need to treat the patient with different drugs. Regarding the high risk uh, patients, I think that uh, the results are very uh, this small. And of course, that we have, uh, even that we have a lot of clinical trials during the last uh, years, we are not uh, able still to improve, not overall survival, not AML evolution. So we are going to review different approaches currently ongoing in order to try to improve outcomes in this uh, difficult setting. Finally, you can see our goals for today. We'd like to enhance your understanding of factors that can inform you about diagnosis and prognosis, including molecular markers in the NDS setting. Of course, we'd like to increase your knowledge of evidence supporting this novel therapy in patients with low and high risk NDS. Uh, and also to provide you a guideline on practical aspect of the, these novel drugs, including the dose monitoring and adverse event management, in order to equip you with the skills that you need to develop personalized medicine in patients with NDS. And let's start with this uh, first topic, uncharted territory in lower risk NDS. We are going to review the modern diagnosis tool and innovative treatment for team-based care. And it's my pleasure to present Dr. Aditi Sastri for the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Montefiore Medical Center Bronx in New York. And she's going to review with clinical case case and other patients presenting with anemia. Thank you very much, Dr. Diaz Campello. That was a very nice uh, overview and introduction of what we hope to cover today. Uh, so let's launch straight into it. I'm very excited to be here with this wonderful audience at ASH 2023. Um, we will start by discussing an older patient presenting with anemia, which is a very typical kind of presentation in an MDS clinic. So Susan is a 72-year-old woman that has been referred to your clinic by primary care colleagues. And right off the bat, we can see that she has anemia. Her hemoglobin is 7.5 grams per deciliter. Her platelets are 250,000, and ANC is preserved at 5,000. Uh, this is a very typical scenario that sometimes, you know, hematologists will see. And uh, really, the discussion is what would we really do to confirm or rule in or rule out MDS? Uh, let me start by asking Dr. Shalis. Rory, what would you do if you saw this patient in clinic? Sure, a couple, that's a good, good, I agree. This is definitely a case we see every day. Usually, there's some selection for these patients when there's already a suggestion of MDS when they make themselves you know, available to our clinic. Um, you're looking at things like micronutrient deficiencies, um, of course, bleeding um, should be one of the, the main things, which often announces itself on history. Um, plasma cell dyscrasias are uh, things which should also be evaluated in this setting. Um, and then, of course, as we get further and further down the line and checking things off, uh, and just given <laughs> my area of interest, uh, MDS and other hemologic neoplasms should be uh, invoked. Fantastic. Let's see what we okay so we have some information here now some more um so we don't have any evidence of bleeding or nutritional deficiencies and as you can see in the pictures right next to it is that on morphology and cytogenetic testing the patient has 17 percent ringed sideroblasts these ring sideroblasts are just precursor erythroblasts with iron trapped in their mitochondria. They have 2% bone marrow blasts and a normal karyotype. So maybe I will ask Dr. Diaz Campello, do you think that you have enough information? What would you do next? 
Do you routinely incorporate genomic testing in your practice? Yes, I think that nowadays uh, we have to incorporate NGS panel in order to identify if the patient is clearly in a lower risk setting. Uh, for example, if see, uh, see pa this patient only presented with SF3B1 mutated, isolated, or is in in in, uh, in a complex, uh, more complex uh, status of the disease. So probably I, uh, of course, recommended uh, NGS panel to final confirmation and identification of the risk. Great. Yeah, completely agree with you both. So this is what we find, which is quite typical in this scenario, uh, is a patient has SF3B1 hotspot mutation H662D. And uh, carrying on, uh, I just want to stress that, you know, as we go along, MDS care is really about a cross-team collaboration. There are multiple people or stakeholders in your clinical practice that can really help you manage the patient well. So it's important as providers for us to tap into these resources, right? So we have pharmacists, our oncology nurses, pathologists, very crucial co colleagues in the whole scheme of things. And I want to just put a plug out even for primary care because as we have become more adept at doing genomic profiling, we're also identifying precursor uh, mutations that may still not be MDS, but you know, patients that have somatic mutations like clonal hematopoiesis or CCAS that have clonal hematopoiesis um, with uh, a cytopenia associated with it. And it's important that, you know, these patients are also followed. Sometimes they may need to be referred for cardiovascular screening. So we just need to work with multiple stakeholders in this setting. So this is just to go over our case. And, you know, of course, how do we diagnose MDS is really we look at cytopenias in a single lineage or more than one. And dysplasia is really, as we know, the hallmark of MDS. Uh, it could be in more than one lineage, or you could find evidence of clonality, an abnormal karyotype on your workup, or you'd see increased blasts, which point to a higher risk of the disease. And uh, as Dr. Shalis said, you know, we really need to exclude other causes. This is important because you might occasionally have a vitamin B12 deficiency masquerading as MDS with dysplasia. And, uh, you know, hopefully you don't see an abnormal karyotype there. But, you know, some of these other things, autoimmune conditions sometimes can coexist with an MDS diagnosis. So that's just something to keep in mind congenital or germline uh, anemias need to be appropriately identified and worked up. Um, and then other hematologic disorders which may overlap like LGL or an MDS-MPN, myeloproliferative neoplasm overlap. I just want to go over some uh, updates that have been made to the prognostic uh, these sort of classification systems for MDS. So in 2022, we saw an update with the WHO classification as well as the ICC classification. And one of the things to really highlight is that for the WHO, they have moved closer to what we do really in clinic, which is a genomic classification. Uh, and so as you can see, there is the isolated DEL5Q, low blasts with SF3B1 mutations, um, and we have this the bi-allelic TP53. So TP53 got incorporated here into the classification system. And then there is morphologic definitions as well that have been maintained with the low blasts, uh, MDS hypoplastic, MDS with increased blasts, and then the ones which are IB1, which is 5 to 9% or IB2, which is 10 to 19%, and then MDS with fibrosis, which may really be the overlap with the myeloproliferative neoplasm. If we compare and contrast between what is between the two classification systems, this may come up occasionally uh, where you practice in conversation with your pathologists. You know, I've noticed people have some uh, affinity or li liking for one system over the other sometimes. 
but there is actually significant amount of overlap between the two classification systems now and uh, they both recognize the biallelic TP53 uh, in, this, uh, in the classification. Uh, they both recognize the MDS with the DEL5Q. Uh, the one point of difference will actually be the MDS slash AML in the ICC 2022. So this is the one that could be the, I, is the IB2 for the WHO. But essentially by ICC, if you have more than 10% blast, this overlaps with AML and the patient can be considered eligible for AML-directed therapies. The IPSSM is another uh, prognostic model that is an update over the IPSSR that we have been using for several years now. And this is a, a prognostic model that incorporates molecular testing in addition to other uh, hematologic, uh, cytologic parameters that the patient has. And here, uh, the, the really beauty of the system is that they had a very large training cohort of patients, almost 3,000 patients from Europe and Japan, based on which this uh, prognostic system was developed and it incorporates mutations, and the top predictors of adverse outcomes, as you can see here, are TP53 multi-hit, FLT3 mutations, and MLLPTD, uh, and then SF3B1 mutations are associated with a favorable outcome. Uh, and of course, this is always uh, with the caveat that there are no other co-mutations associated with it. It's actually a really simple tool to use, and I have been using it in clinic. You just have to input the data, as you can see on the slides here. Uh, you find that there's, uh, you know, columns to put in your bone marrow blast, hemoglobin, platelet. You can put in the cytogenetics, the mutations, and it gives you a nice output, which is like visual as well as kind of tells you exactly where your patient falls from very low to very high risk. Um, and this particular patient that we computed for us is low risk MDS at this point. So I encourage people to incorporate this into their documentation and their practice. Uh, it's also as the tool is used more, the tool gets trained more as well. So it's dynamic and I think it will capture over time the whole spectrum of disease that we're seeing here um, in the world. There are, of course, limitations of these sort of prognostic systems. And I want to highlight this uh, uh, abstract, which is going to be presented later at ASH, is really that there are certain types of MDS that are not well captured in terms of their risk even today with uh, the IPSSR or the IPSSM. And a good example of this is really the germline MDS like DDX41 mutations. And this abstract being presented by Dr. Gunari actually across several centers really compares a cohort of DDX41 mutant patients against DDX41 wild type. And what I want to highlight is if you look at this cumulative events graph, which is on the very right of the slide, the best way to really prognosticate these patients were those that had truncating mutations in the second hit or the R525H of the DDX41. These patients did worse compared to any of the other groups, but this wasn't really well captured across the um, IPSSM and, you know, sort of was not able to prognosticate these patients into good or bad risk compared to the wild type. So this is an area where we need to do a lot more work and define germline MDS is better. Uh, the IPS, so what are the big changes IPSSR to IPSSM? So if you look at this kind of curve, you can see that with the IPSSR, 22% and 21% respectively were upstaged to high risk and very high risk in the IPSSM. And 51% with high risk IPSSR were upstaged to very high risk IPSSM. Um, I don't want to just go through these percentages, but I think why this is really relevant is because trials that are currently accruing patients 
Some of them have started in an IPSSR era and we're still using IPSSR to put patients on study. And we have to recognize that if you plug the numbers into IPSSM, their risk categorization might change and this might have potentially changed how you treated or put whether you put the patient on study in the first place or not. So as we go along, more clinical trials will incorporate the IPSSM as well. So that will help us accurately prognosticate the patients in clinic. And so the recommendations really or the take homes for our patient in this case, just to summarize is always to be mindful for us to rule out other causes of anemia in clinic combined with all the tools we have available to us that include molecular testing that are an essential component of MDS uh, diagnostic assessment. Keep in mind, we have a new classification systems uh, now and also a new prognostic model with the IPSSM. Um, and I think for this patient, we did confirm a diagnosis of low risk MDS and we will continue to discuss as the case evolves. So I would uh, pass this on now again to Dr. Diaz Campello to guide us through how we would manage anemia effectively in a patient with low risk MDS. Thank you, Sadie. Let's continue with our patient. Our patient, remember, is uh, 70 year old and is the typical case with a lower risk MDS, presenting only with anemia, no other uh, cytopenia, and generally with symptoms related to this anemia, uh, with a deterioration in quality of life. Uh, we uh, initiate uh, transfusions in these patients, and she requires at least four red blood cell units every two months. I probably ask my co panelists uh, for discussion. Uh, do you think that this is a clear case for transfusion dependency or not? Yeah. Would you? That's it? Okay. Yeah, so the patient does have a transfusion burden of four units over two months. Uh, so over a like eight week period, we do say that she is having like four units. So I would say yes, for sure. This patient is a clear case of transfusion dependency and merits treatment. Yes, okay. I think that the level of hemoglobin is too low, below eight, so she needs uh, to, uh, to be transfused. And of course, the period between uh, transfusions are uh, very short, so it's a clear case of transfusion dependency. And uh, regarding the treatment for this patient, we can, of course, continue with transfusions with no change or try to incorporate any treatment and nowadays, we have to choose uh, between Luz Patterset if in first line, based on the results of the common trials that we are going to review in a few minutes, or uh, ESA therapy, that is a traditional uh, drugs that, that has been used in this uh, setting. What do you think? Any impression? Do you continue? Any, any continue with transfusion alone or not? That's always an option for the patient. I mean, just to kind of chime in on what you know the prior question. I mean, this is a lot of a lot of this is in the eyes of the beholder. Uh, you know, there was a fairly recent survey study done about three or four years ago, looking at providers and what what's your trigger for transfusion for a patient with MDS. And there was a lot of variance. Uh, about fifteen percent, if I recall, actually had no numeric or threshold below which they would transfuse. Others classically would describe it to be seven. Some centers use eight. That is our practice. Um, we could talk about that later. Um, so dependence, I'd say, would depend on comorbidities, patient preference, which, again, would include continuing, if they're not too burdened from a quality of life standpoint, to keep getting transfusions. Not something we prefer, just because, as we know, there are risks with each transfusion and the cumulative risks as well, usually iron overload, which is something we always cite. Um, that is certainly an option, but, of course, we'll talk about a loose powder set, the ESAs, and some of the other new things coming up. Okay. Let's uh, review because here, here you can see a resume of the current uh, treatment for NDS. This is a publication uh, for Dr. Garcia Manero. Re uh, in, it's a resume for the available options nowadays in this uh, setting. Our patient could be here on the left uh, in the lower risk setting. And of course, is, if a clinical trial is, uh, is possible uh, for, uh, for the patient, is if she can be included in a clinical trial, of course, it, this should be the best option. But in the, in the majority of the, of, the, of the times, we don't have this option, and we have to choose between all these uh, available uh, drugs. 
Uh, remember that uh, traditionally we have these two options for these uh, patients, red blood cell transfusion. I'd like to highlight that even one patient in a lower risk setting is uh, requiring transfusion. They need to, uh, the patient needs to be always under iron chelation in order to try to avoid the iron overload because when the patient is in a chronic phase of the disease and in a chronic transfusion, iron level low is going to increase uh, the risk of death due to an increased risk of infection, increased risk of cardiac event uh, due to this iron overload and, dam iron, uh, and, dam iron and organ damage uh, based on these uh, uh, transfusions. So if the patient only uh, is in transfusion dependency, we need at least to try to collate uh, the patient. This, uh, are not, this uh, approach is not going to be translated in an improvement in quality of life. Several studies have confirmed this situation and transfusions are going to uh, not, I think, uh, to reach the goal of improved quality of life and, of course, not to try to improve the outcome of the patient. Another general uh, treatment in this setting is uh, erythropoietic stimulating agents. They are recommended in the majority of the, the guidelines even that there is not a proof in the majority of the countries. And in Europe, for example, we have the approval for this indication in 2018. This is a, also a very good uh, drug in this context uh, because the safety profile is, uh, is very good for patients, for other patients, with no relevant and no frequent adverse events and with a very good management. And uh, if we decide to uh, start with uh, this drug, we need to use larger dose should be necessary. And as it happened with, uh, with every treatment in the lower risk setting, we have to take into account the loss of effect over time. So we have to identify the best treatment for our patient. Nowadays, we have a novel drug in this uh, setting that is Luspatercept. Luspatercept is a fusion protein that consists in a modified activin 2 uh, receptor 2B that is going to uh, bind different ligand, ligands for this TGF-beta receptor. And when this drug acts, it's going to inhibit the uh, in inhibition of erythropoiesis. They block these different ligands and inhibit the activation of this pathway that uh, is going to uh, induce the stop in maturation and uh, is going to induce uh, the death of uh, erythroblasts. And when we are blocking this with these uh, novel drugs, we are going to enhance the late stage of erythropoiesis and we are going to increase hemoglobin levels uh, due to a, a better, uh, much uh, better production of red blood, mature red blood cells. And in this setting, we have uh, developed this phase three clinical trial, the COMMANDS trial, that compares in first line treatment uh, ESAs and Luspatercept in patients with thin the lower risk setting requiring transfusions and not previously treated. Luspatercept was tested at uh, the initial dose of one milligrams per kilo every three weeks subcutaneously, and we can increase the dose up to 1.75 milligrams per kilo. Hippo-alpha was initiated at the dose of 450 units per kilo subcutaneously every week, and we can also increase the dose up to 1,050 units per kilo. And the ratio, the randomization was uh, one to one, and uh, uh, more than 175 patients were included in each uh, run, in each arm. Here you can see the main uh, results of the clinical trial. The primary endpoint was a very uh, robust endpoint requiring trans transfusion independency, prolonged transfusion independency for more than 12 weeks, and also an increase in hemoglobin level. In this mean, more than 1.5 grams per deciliter during the first 24 weeks of treatment. And as you can see in the slide, 58% of the patients uh, in the arm of Luspatercept reach this goal of the, this primary endpoint as compared to only 31% in the uh, ESA's arm. And these uh, results confirm the approval of uh, Luspatercept in this first light treatment for patients nowadays in the, F the, in the United States and probably soon in other uh, countries based on the benefit of this drug. When we also analyze different subgroups, 
uh, looking for the responses, we can confirm that the benefit of Luspatercep uh, is uh, even higher in the majority of these categories. Uh, Luspatercep responses are uh, present in, in blue as compared to ESA responses in orange, and as you can see, is uh, superior for patients with low and high endogenous HIPO levels, uh, low and high transfusion burden as compared to ESAs, is uh, superior especially in patients with residual blast, and similarly uh, to ESA in patients with non-residual blast phenotype, and again superior in patients with SF3B1 mutations. Another important thing is the duration of the response. And as you can see here in the figure, we can confirm that the median duration of this transfusion independency is completely superior uh, in patients with Luspatercep, 126 weeks, that means 2.5 years, as compared to 77 weeks, one year uh, uh, shorter uh, in hypo alpha. And when we Interestingly, com compare uh, the results of residroblast positive and residroblast negative phenotype uh, according to the duration of response. We can uh, identify that, of course, responses are more prolonged in patients with residroblast and are even higher. The percentage of responders uh, in the in the arm of Luspatercep. We can confirm that even that responses are similar. Uh, between uh, LUSPA and ESAs in the patients with no residual blast, the duration of the response is much prolonged in patients with LUSPATERCEP. In this SAS meeting tomorrow afternoon, we are going to assist to the uh, final uh, results of the clinical trial. These are uh, the interim analysis results. And tomorrow afternoon, Dr. Garcia Manero is going to review the final uh, analysis in this SAS meeting. And in this, submit, in this submitting, we are going to confirm the results previously published. 60% of patients uh, reaching transfusion independencies and an increase in hemoglobin level as compared to 34.8 in the ESA arm. Also, the prolonged duration of the response uh, confirming with uh, Luspatercep and, of course, the benefit in the different subgroups. So we are going to see tomorrow uh, afternoon at this uh, post uh, oral communication. Finally, regarding uh, safety, you can see here in the slide that we, do, we don't have any concern regarding safety and, uh, and, and uh, adverse event. They are close similar to those presented in ESA uh, with ESAs. The majority of them are grades one and two, and I only like to highlight the presence of hypertension in some patients, a few patients uh, within the loose pattern set arm, that sometimes less than 8% could be in grades 3 or 4. And we'd like to take into account in order to control this hypertension and not discard the patient for the treatment. Also, the, uh, the drug did not increase the rate of AML evolution, high risk in this progression, or death. So it's a very safe uh, drug uh, in this uh, context. Let's uh, finish in with this dose consideration. You remember that you have to start the dose at one milligram per kilo subcutaneously once every three weeks in this uh, setting. And we have to check prior to each dose the, the level of hemoglobin and also the transfusion needs for the patient. If the patient is not responding and also is not presenting adverse events, we have to increase the dose in order to reach response. And you can increase the dose up to 1.33 or even up to 1.75 milligrams per kilo every th three weeks. If the patient did not respond, you need to increase the dose, especially if the patient did not present adverse event that is typical in this setting. And of course, remember that if the patient uh, presented hypertension due to a no new onset or even exacerbation, you can uh, use anti-hypertensive in order to avoid uh, discontinuation for the drug and check pre uh, blood pressure uh, prior to its administration. The, here you can see the summary of the, point, the points for the common study. Luspatercep sub superiority, two times higher as compared to ESA, uh, in the primary endpoint, that is transfusion independency and hemoglobin increase. Also, these uh, responses are more durable, near one year prolonged uh, as compared to ESAs. We have no uh, adverse event, no relevant adverse event with this uh, drug, 
and is nowadays, uh, nowadays included in first light treatment, as like, like the first light treatment option in patients with this uh, low risk NDS, uh, transfusion dependency in the NCCN gui guidelines. And I think I'd like to finish uh, commenting, commenting that this is the first and only therapy to demonstrate in a face-to-face -face study uh, uh, the benefit against ESAs and represents, of course, a paradigm shift for the treatment of uh, 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 low risk NDS associated anemia. Finally, my take homes for this patient, Susan, I, of course, uh, prefer to start with uh, loose pattern set because we are going to uh, reach higher percentage of responses and a major duration of this response and is the first light treatment for this uh, patient. Remember, as of course, uh, to the dose escalation after the study, and if the patient did not respond, you can increase the dose level if the patient did not present it adverse events that are not frequent, and is of special interest, as of course, in real sideroblast positive patients, but also in non-real sideroblast uh, phenotype. Now, let's move to another case uh, patient because uh, this is a generally patient in the lower setting that we have uh, in the clinical consultants, a patient presenting ESA refractory disease. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rari Salis from the Yale School of Medicine and Yale Cancer Center. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to share the gratitude to those folks with us on today. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, today. This is George, 75-year-old gentleman with a confirmed diagnosis of low-risk MDS and anemia. He's received treatment in the community practice, frontline treatment with ESA for RBC transfusion. And after 14 months of adequate, adequate ESA therapy, emphasis on adequate, 14 months is actually quite uh, around the average, anywhere from 18 to 24 months, depending on the data sets at which you look. But 14 months, not uh, unexpected. Adequacy of ESA therapy is dependent upon the schedule, but also the dose. Um, and you had seen some of that uh, that Dr. Campella presented for the commands strategy for ESA dosing. But unfortunately, after 14 months of therapy, George experiences increase in his RBC transfusion requirements to, at this point, three units per month. So he would actually revert back to, quote, transfusion dependence. Um, and as is just common slash good practice, no new causes of anemia are identified. So going back to the, hearkening back to, hey, is he bleeding? Is he having any, any new causes on top of low-risk MDS, which... Also, you should invoke the possibility of progression to high-risk MDS, if not frank AML, with a marrow evaluation. Um, his disease is not found to harbor DEL5Q, an important consideration here. So the question for my co-panelists is, should ESA be continued? And I'll just open this up to Dr. Shastri and Capella. Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, you're absolutely right. I think, you know, many a times I do counsel patients on ESA therapy that, you know, some people are late responders, but they can have a sustained response. With regard to should ESA therapy be continued, I mean, at this point, we're seeing a significant change, which is an increased transfusion requirement. Uh, I actually would initiate workup, as you said, you know, just to make sure that at this point there is no progression of disease, particularly to high-risk MDS uh, or, um, you know, just leukemic progression to AML reassess the genomic profile to see if we have any new mutations that we may want to capture while making a decision. But essentially, I think at this point, we should start exploring second-line therapeutic options if none of these things are found to be the case. I agree. Uh, I guess to you, Dr. Kampala, what other options, to Dr. Shastri's point, can be considered? Would you add growth factor? Do you transition to loose patercept, lenalidomide, HMA therapy? Yes, I think that nowadays uh, is a very good, great moment because we have several options to try to to use uh, in this setting. And I think that we have to highlight that it's uh, patient dependent. And you have to identify the, the patient's disease and which could be the best option for its tra treatment. For example, uh, do you, do you need to know the presence or not of blast. Uh, the presence of nor of uh, del 5q is not the case, but uh, in, uh, in the non del 5q setting, for, for for example, you need to check uh, endogenous hypo level, and probably for HMA, uh, you have to choose, choose probably this uh, uh, drug 
if the patient is in adverse uh, prognosis feature, with is, is presented with adverse prognosis features like a severe cytopenia or or any of this. So I think that this patient dependent, you have to identify the best treatment based on the patients and disease characteristics, and we have uh, several options nowadays. And I promise we're going to talk about all of these. Oh, of course. Is there a role for telomerase inhibition? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I know, Dr. Shalis, you're going to talk about the data, but, you know, we have some promising and positive data from the IMATEL stat. And, uh, you know, this is hopefully an option coming up soon in the clinic. Uh, and, uh, yes, in addition to everything, I just want to say, like Dr. Diaz Campello said also, just reiterate the point that pre patient preference is very important in the second line setting with regard to making options between oral versus subcutaneous and injectable therapies, geographic disparities in terms of how close they live to the cancer center versus far away. So these are all very important things to have a good discussion with your patient about. I'm glad you brought that up because uh, locale might matter for, you know, what the patient can accomplish safely. Um, administration schedule is another consideration for these non-oral therapies of which telomerase inhibition is going to be one of the relevant things we'll talk about in a little while. So George, he got ESA. Um, and as you would expect, I mean, you've seen some of this from Dr. Campello's slides. It's not indefinite. It will fail the patient at some point, as does Luce Patterson. Um, but this is something that it, can we, for the most part, estimated based on really two factors, one of which we use because uh, it's the, probably the most objective, I would say. Uh, this is the baseline serum endogenous erythropoietin repo level. Uh, and there are graded thresholds uh, below which you can actually see an increase in the rate of response you might expect. Um, this is one uh, risk uh, scoring system uh, from some of the European groups here, you can see here on the bottom. Um, and essentially, the lower you go, the greater the risk, uh, sorry, the greater the rate of, uh, of response, which can be as high as 70%. In fact, I've seen, you know, some, some data sets kind of reported as being upwards of 90%, you know, close to zero serum EPO. Uh, but uh, one of the competing things is the rate uh, of transfusions that's uh, being accepted by the patient. Um, you can see there's negative scoring here. The more transfusable the patient is. Um, growth factor support is something I think we should at least just touch on. Uh, there are a number of trials, uh, sorry, a number of studies, some of which are prospective, which have shown that uh, either uh, in, out of the gate, ESA plus myelid growth factor, or at the time where you're really concluding there's lack of response to ESA, the eight-week mark at a minimum, but maybe upwards of 12 weeks, adding myelid growth factor can quote unquote augment the response. This is a practice which is variable depending on which provider you ask, but this can be, uh, just forgive the vague term, considered. Uh, we've heard about loose recept already. Uh, in the frontline setting uh, via commands, however, uh, the trial that got loose recept's first approval was derived from the Metalis trial, which was, I don't have the schema, uh, at least in visual form here, but this was a post ESA failure or predicted to lack to respond. Uh, an RS positive disease restricted population. And you could see this is uh, the rates of uh, transfusion burden decreases uh, across really looking at low transfusion burden and high transfusion burdened patients, uh, favoring uh, to a substantial degree loose patercept over placebo. Upwards of half of patients are going to have half of their RBCs cut. And then uh, uh, some patients actually have 75% reduction. So quite an attractive option for the patient in this case who would have disease that is RS positive. So uh, this is available. Um, I don't know if we were given George's diseases RS status. Um, forgive me. Um, and uh, on top of the the rates of response, similar to commands, the duration of response is, is certainly uh, attractive here. You can see that some patients uh, can experience you know these the, uh, these responses for at least a year with no new safety signals. And uh, you know the AEs, but I, I would agree are are for the most part uh, acceptable and really worth the benefit that, that, that these patients are deriving. And you will hear an update on this uh, on Monday in one of the afternoon sessions. I do think lenalidomide is underappreciated as being an effective option outside of Del5Q uh, disease. We, we've known for quite some time, really, you know, upwards of a decade, that lower risk MDS with non-Del5Q still has, still has some act, uh, susceptibility to lenalidomide uh, via a number of mechanisms. Its MOA is, uh, for the most part, pleiotropic. Uh, we could look to MDS-001, 002, and MDS-05 was a randomized trial, placebo-controlled, which actually showed that even though it's not as exquisite as Del5Q, uh, this is still an option, especially in oral therapy. Uh, I wouldn't call it benign. Some patients have to come off for significant toxicity, of course, and it has a number of other burdens. 
Um, but this is something that should be considered, uh, of course, if this patient is not bound for clinical trial, or if you're thinking about something we're going to talk about a little bit, HMA. Here we go. So HMAs, I regard them as sort of being the last dish effort for low risk MDS and essentially the harbinger for when you should consider transplantation for a low risk disease patient, something which actually I think is underrecognized as well. Um, however, of course, this is not similar to lenalidomide, not a non-toxic medication. Uh, and there have been efforts over the last five, six, seven years to really attenuate the dose to which these patients are exposed to really get as much of the benefit as possible, but not encountering as much of the cytopenic depth that can come with things like infection and things which really, uh, really drive a detriment to health-related quality of life. Um, there have been uh, a couple of studies, um, one of which is, uh, this is Dr. Sasaki's update to what was previously uh, the data published by uh, Elias Jabour and the MD Anderson colleagues um, from 2017, I believe, looking at AZA given on the three-day schedule as well as decitabine given on a three-day schedule, classical dosing, but they just abbreviated to three days. And you see the responses are, are you know, uh, quite striking, 60% in the overall population with perhaps a preference for decitabine given on three-day schedule um, with um, uh, a certain uh, strata with regards to what types of responses you would regard as being more meaningful. So uh, this is something that I personally do uh, quite frequently for patients that have maybe seen the ESA, uh, or have no real path to in expecting a benefit from ESA, it was Patercept for that matter. Uh, maybe we're not as enthused with giving lead maybe they've already seen it. Um, my practice is to give, quote, low-dose HMA with preference for decitabine. However, we have to acknowledge that there are oral formulations. There have been, uh, this is a long-standing effort to really develop an oral agent which can overcome the significant first-pass metabolism, hepatic first-pass, um, um, and what is being driven by cytidine deaminase, which is the enzyme which inactivates uh, decitabine, for instance. Um, and now, based on this is the ascertain trial, we have an approved agent, uh, which is cetazuridine decitabine, Aztec 727, or the brand name, of course, being Incovi, which is uh, found to be PK equivalent to decitabine. Uh, so for the patient who, the person that's trying to you know, usurp you know, my preference for this, for this talk, uh, but for the patient who I would uh, embark, who I would say should embark on low dose, quote unquote, decitabine, my preference is to give Aztec 727 or cetazuridine uh, decitabine on the three-day schedule. Um, and this is just more data in support and actually kind of updated data that uh, was just presented not too long ago um, uh, for uh, this approach in lower risk disease uh, with oral, um, sorry, with, uh, with oral decitabine here. Um, so sort of a, kind of like a 2.0 version of the parental version of decitabine. And nothing which is surprising. Uh, its safety is exactly what you would expect with parental decitabine. Uh, a a non-low, even though small numbers, a non-low rate of RBCTI at eight weeks, a classical primary endpoint for these lower-risk MDS trials that you're going to see time and time again. Um, and uh, this is something that uh, I think supports uh, much of our practice. Of course, enter Metalstat, uh, a novel uh, MOA. This is a first-in-class agent. Um, this is, as you know, a telomerase uh, inhibitor uh, based on the fact that we know that telomerase activity appears to be uh, quite, quite elevated uh, across a number of myeloid malignancies. Um, this is uh, not an MDS isolated uh, sort of effect. In this in MPNs, there's actually some data in ET, which is for the most part attractive. Um, and I think we're going to see some data for high risk MDS and AML, hopefully in the near future. Um, and one other thing of note, this does appear to be of a selective mechanism, you know, hence the overexpression upon malignant tissue and largely as you might expect, and we'll see, maybe some sparing of the uh, normal uh, myeloid hematopoietic compartment. So this is basically launching us into the iMERGE phase three trial. This is a uh, double blind randomized trial, randomizing patients after ESA failure or really no path to response based on a baseline EPO level, as you can see the second bullet point here. Uh, the definition for quote transfusion dependence was a little bit different than uh, what you had seen in commands. These were, even though like from a median number of RBCs uh, transfused, and I don't think we have this data available to show, uh, maybe a little bit higher than the commands population. This is four units compared to the two units, kind of aligning with IWG definitions. Uh, Del5Q disease uh, was excluded, um, and similarly, these patients did not get LAN, and uh, like most trials, they don't get HMA for low-risk disease, but that's an option as we talked about. Uh, important points of stratification, uh, two here. So transfusion burden, uh, probably uh, an increasing predictor of, um, uh, of response, as well as IPSS, in this case, risk category, low versus I I one. And uh, a classical primary endpoint, as you imagined, uh, imagined, this was two-to-one randomization, just to make it more attractive for patients to enroll, metal stat versus placebo. 
and kind of classical secondary endpoints. And uh, I mean, most of you know this, of course, but uh, compared to placebo, a metal stat just worked better. 40% rate of eight week TI uh, with a graded detriment uh, as you kind of expand it out, kind of aligning with uh, a number of other products like loose powder set, for instance. But some patients, about 20%, do enjoy this transfusion independence for at least a year. Uh, this is really just a visual representation, a representation of the same exact thing, but uh, you could just see that some of these patients are doing quite well for a pretty darn long time. Uh, this appears to be the case across subgroups. Um, one of the points of stratification was IPSS risk. You could see here when incorporating the molecular data, uh, this does appear to transcend that IPSS M risk as well. And we don't have it here, but uh, it's important to note this is actually uh, the case across RS status as well. Um, th there's a forest plot that's uh, kind of classically shown in these talks um, that shows that RS status didn't really predict lack of response or more explicit response uh, when exposed to a metal stat. And you're going to hear an update about this um, tomorrow uh, in one of the afternoon sessions as well. Um, of course, we have to talk about the toxicity. This has gotten a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of buzz. Um, the majority of patients will experience grade three plus hematologic tox, mostly by way of thrombocytopenia and neutropenia, um, with otherwise, I would say, hackney term, but uh, acceptable rate of non-hemologic toxicity. Um, it's not given here, but 80% uh, of these patients have this, uh, this, uh, these events uh, revert back to grade one or less uh, within four weeks. Um, and growth factor was used in, I think, about a third of patients. So you, we can navigate patients through this and I would argue, and a unique person saying this, that this is just evidence of on-target effect. This is a stem cell disease. You're actually, for a transient period of time, impacting the malignant compartment and just giving your non-malignant compartment in maybe four or six weeks' time a chance to kind of you know, restore a normal hematopoiesis within the marrow. And uh, another thing which got some press was the, the uh, transaminase elevations, but no cases of high, highs law here. Uh, so I, I would agree. Uh, largely acceptable profile, but uh, something that has to be noted and does require some vigilance for any patient that, you know, should we be, have this in our armamentarium in the time be, uh, in, 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 the near, uh, in the near future has to be considered. Uh, just to kind of couch this with at least some optimism before we close out the mental stat talk, uh, I think this is risk that should be accepted um, based on the ethics that we've seen, but also the suggestion, emphasis on suggestion, that this could be a disease modifying agent. Uh, an MDS, one of the better surrogates we have until we actually have event-based endpoint data for disease-modifying uh, effect are the VAF kinetics or the variant allele frequency reductions that we're seeing across a number of molecular subtypes. Uh, and these are the four most common you would expect, SO3B1, TAT2, and then and the DAT, uh, quote-unquote, mutations. Uh, with, you know, they have some p-values up top here, and three of the four are, quote-unquote, statistically significant. But visually, you can see this is kind of transcends all molecular subgroups. So, uh, stay tuned for more event-based data, which of course will take more time. So my take-homes uh, for the low-risk disease subset, uh, of course, just given this is a heterogeneous disease uh, constituted by a number of molecular mechanisms and, uh, mechanisms and epigenetic mechanisms, we need newer agents with different MOAs, especially in patients who have failed what I would argue is a non-toxic medication in ESAs. Medalists sort of set the stage for LUSPA being a great option for MDS-RS uh, disease uh, after ESA failure. Uh, Len, uh, it's a practice of mine to use this before I move on to HMAs. Uh, and then iMERGE, of course, is setting the stage for a metal stat maybe uh, being an option that we're looking forward to. Uh, and I think I just said uh, bullet number five. Let's uh, move to the high risk setting. Uh, we are going to review the crucial steps for delivering modern and emerging, modern and emerging therapies. And uh, again, Dr. Salis is going to review the implications of high-risk features. Let's continue. Proceed. Okay. New patient. This is Michelle. She's a 68-year-old woman with a bona fide diagnosis of MDS. Uh, she's encountering some anemia along with some classical symptomatology, fatigue, shortness of breath. She looks pallorous in the, in the, in the uh, clinic. Um, looks like she has a bone marrow evaluation and uh, enumeration puts this at 10% blasts. And in stark contrast to every patient we've discussed uh, thus far, this is the other end of the spectrum, uh, worst of the worst. Uh, T53 mutated disease and complex karyotype, inclusive of monosomy 17. And we have the NGS results on the right side here. She has two clinically significant variants. So I'm glad the pathologist is calling this. In TP53 with fairly robust VAFs of 45 and 47% respectively, nothing else detected. So essentially no functioning P53 protein. This could, you could spend a week, uh, weeks-long symposium on this exact case, but 
what is the utility of tools such as the FASM in the higher risk disease setting? Yeah, this is a this is a good question, Dr. Shalis. Thank you. And you know, like you said, this is a very common clinical scenario. The IPSSM in this case, you know, specifically looks at also the allelic burden of TP53. So if it's monoallelic versus biallelic, multi-hit disease. And the IPSSM will uh, potentially upstage this patient a little bit more. So you, what you will see is high to very high risk, you know, so this would be like a very high risk patient accompli uh, accompanied by a complex karyotype. So I think right off the bat, you know, if this was not already like super clear, I think IPSSM can help you prognosticate this patient and also potentially make in addition to MDS, AML-like therapy available. So you could change your, you know, that could be incorporated into your decision making and conversation with the patient, transplant uh, considerations, etc. Yeah. I agree. Uh, I think this is a very informative case. The 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 fact that we offer 10% blasts here per, I, per ICC actually would qualify this patient as having MDS AML mm -hmm. with, based on the data we've seen in the last slide, bilateral loss of P53. Um, next question for you, Dr. Compel, if you don't mind. Would transplant be a, quote, standard option? <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, do, do try to, to uh, transplant these patients, even that the outcome should be not as good as expected, but... Uh, because uh, patients with a viallelic mutation of TP53 are uh, very bad with any any treatment, but uh, we don't know, we don't have any other option. And regarding this, uh, imp the implication of this status of outcome, I think that nowadays is not a curable disease, even with transplant, but you should uh, do the transplant because you can probably prolong our survival at least uh, a few months or and in, in this time, probably you have the opportunity to participate in another clinical trial if possible, and, and the patient could improve uh, survival. But I think that transplant should be down, uh, but with the identification that this is not a curable patient. Yeah. Well said. There, there are some nihilists out there that would not even offer this therapy, which is not, uh, not cheap um, uh, to a patient like this. But I would agree with you. I mean, there are some data to suggest that even if we're not curing the vast majority of these patients, we might move the needle a little bit by a few months. And if that associates with an improvement in health related quality of life, yeah. I would still offer it as well. And what are the implications for P53 status, quote unquote status, I guess we're getting to allelic status for outcomes? Yeah, so I mean, there are suggestions from, uh, you know, at the, from pre IPSSM from Dr. Pape Manuel's group and uh, that really the PP, TP53 monoallelic status is associated with better outcomes in MDS. But in this particular case, when the patient has two biallelic mutations or multi-hit, you know, the implications honestly are quite dismal to be, and we don't, as uh, Dr. D.S. Campello was saying, you know, for sometimes transplant is offered due to lack of a better option really than anything else. And uh, we really do want to focus all our attention on finding better therapies for these patients. Yeah. This is reference to what is known as the Validate database and uh, collection of studies. Um, and this is uh, a collection of patients that were treated largely prospectively on clinical trials with HMA monotherapy, mind you. Um, and this uh, is, you're gonna see some data presented by our outstanding fellow, Tarek uh, Kiwan, uh, amongst other colleagues. Uh, looking at this data set. And one of the key things that uh, is going to be offered is that there's no clear difference in survival based on this allelic state, monoallelic or you know, mul uh, single hit versus uh, double hit P53 status. Uh, and also it has a ratio of one offer based on the type of HMA used. Decidabine versus acetacetine doesn't really matter. Uh, and as you've seen time and time again on similar KM curves compared to wild type disease, this is uh, quite a dismal outcome, unfortunately. Okay, so uh, we've, we've discussed that the IPSSM can clearly predict poor outcomes for many patients. One of the things that is the thing which is, is one, of the, one of the things which is weighted more heavily is P53 multi-hit status. Um, defined in a number of ways, depending on which data set you look at. I mean, we could talk about Dr. Pep Emanuel and Elsa Bernard's uh, collection of studies and how they defined it and how they basically uh, assigned loss of heterozygosity 
many of these mechanisms or, or testing platforms might not be available at some other centers. We looked at things like double mutation, VAF cutoffs, 50% buying it being one of the more classical ones, even though that's probably the weakest data to say that's true, uh, LOH, um, and then uh, a single mutation with anything which is predicting loss of 17P, I think it's P13, but 17P or monosomy 17 in its entirety. Um, and then on the right, there are some things which, of course, you've seen before that SA31 can definitely associate with uh, better prognoses. But these two boxes inherently don't associate together. Uh, hearkening back to uh, the visual as to the, the tool that we'd be using for this patient, uh, even though the patient's data are not specific to this, uh, this particular uh, input, um, but you can see on the, on the farthest most right, you can see that we do account for the number of P53 mutations, the VAF that's, that's assigned and uh, loss of heterozygosity or LOH, as I had mentioned, uh, which in most times, you know, might be not available, but uh, maybe by this time, if you have NGS data, you'll have conventional karyotyping by G-banding analysis and, and FISH studies for 17, et cetera. So in comparison to the treatment or management of low-risk disease, higher-risk disease, you can see that we're kind of more obligated to intervene on the disease itself and try to, try to alter its natural history and really modify the disease. Uh, by way of, of course, this is a test, the right answer is clinical trial, but if that is not available, and maybe trials will be inclusive of these agents, HMA, intensive chemotherapy, with maybe some of the more attractive data being for CPX351 in higher risk disease subsets, mostly those with increased or excess blasts. And then in some cases, you proceed right to transplantation, um, probably more attractive uh, for the patient who doesn't have a, quote, increase in blasts, even though there are some retrospective data to show that maybe the post-transplant outcomes are better if we offer a little bit of HMA prior to transplantation. And this is a, uh, an adaptation of the NCCN guidelines. Uh, suffice it to say, the first question you're asking is, does this patient have a path to transplant by way of, you know, quote, eligibility, donor selection, uh, et cetera? If the answer is yes, then your goal is to get there maybe as soon as possible, but maybe some consideration, as I'd mentioned, for giving HMA for set of reduction, or that could also include IDH1 inhibition now, uh, but of course, clinical trial as well. If there's no reasonable path to transplant, then you're probably talking palliative therapy with the hope of just improving survival uh, with the kind of on the back of that disease modifying potential. And uh, just the one, I think this is the closing slide for my, uh, my section, is transplanted MDS. This, is, uh, this has been shown a, a number of ways to be beneficial for a number of patients. Going back to the original Markov modeling, uh, you, know, you know, quite maybe outdated at this point now that we have better molecular data, um, this, uh, this is one trial by Dr. Nak uh, Nakamura and colleagues, and there's a, another uh, trial uh, which is showing the same exact thing. These were randomized trials to no donor versus donor arms um, and selected for mostly older patients. So this actually answered two questions, really. Hey, are we actually doing the right thing for older patients, you know, greater than 60 up to 75, I think, in both of these trials? And my co-panelists can correct me, but I think the Nakamura study was the one which actually mandated that all patients got a little bit of ASA before transplant, but you could see uh, there's a clear benefit to these patients looking at the left-sided KM curve with the right one showing the same thing. So this is really just meant to say that there is no age cutoff for transplant, and uh, we should be offering this to patients that have a diagnosis of high-risk MDS. And that's where I'll uh, close. Thank you so much. Okay. And finally, we are going to present the current and the future options for the treatment of high-risk NDS. Again, Dr. Sastri, please. Thank you, Dr. Diaz Campello, and th thank you, Dr. Chalice, for that very wonderful overview of the newer therapies for low-risk MDS. So let's dive into a case for high-risk MDS and what are cert some options that we can offer our patients that are also in clinical trials and developments. We will discuss that next. Uh, so this is our patient, Michelle, again, who has now confirmed MDS, 10% blasts, a TP53 mutation and complex karyotype. And unfortunately, through treatment, her performance status is now declining and her ECOG performance status is too. Uh, assuming now that, you know, this is what is going on, that the patient is having a declining performance status, there is an ongoing donor search, which is delayed, which does happen often, you know, so, you know, if patient, patients are from certain underserved minority groups or 
don't have good sibling matches. In some cases, the donor searches do get delayed. I want to ask my fellow panelists. So, uh, Dr. Diaz Campello, in your practice, would you still be looking for a donor for this patient? Would you start them on some kind of therapy, whether HMA or something else? Yes, probably if you if you only wait, the disease is going to progress. So probably we should start with uh, any therapy in this bad uh, situation, trying to to improve uh, the result, the disease status, try to reach a complete remission, and after that, try to perform the transplant. I agree. I, I think I, I want to also put a plug out there that, you know, there are multiple sources of stem cells at now, you know, so many centers, including ours, are adapting also heavily to using haplo stem cell transplant to yeah. open up more options for patients that don't have matched unrelated donors. Um, and in addition, I also want to say that if the patient has been transfusion dependent for a long period of time, this could compromise, you know, their liver and response to conditioning therapy. So chelation therapy should be continued if you do see that uh, the patient's iron bur has iron overload and high transfusion burden as this can impact survival post-transplant. Uh, Dr. Shalis, would you consider any particular clinical trial? Are there any options that, in your opinion, are particularly promising for this difficult group of patients? Yes, you have to consider a clinical trial for this patient. Um, amongst all the critical needs and myeloid malignancies, this is a patient who exemplifies the top one, in my opinion. Uh, we need novel therapies for this, this disease, which doesn't really respond to a lot. And if it does, it doesn't last very long at all. Um, unfortunately, there have been, on that note, a, a number of disappointments with regards to quote-unquote targeted therapies, but there are some other therapies which hold some promise. Anti-CD47, SERP-alpha access inhibitors have, uh, you know, had some hurdles, but there are alternative mechanisms and products which are in stone development and actually in, in, uh, in, in study. Um, and then there are a couple other products um, that uh, you might actually hear about at this ASH that actually have shown some suggestion that it could be working for these patients, but the duration of response is the thing uh, that we really had to look out for. So clinical trial is the correct answer for this patient, for sure. Thank you, Dr. Shalis. I completely agree with you. Um, so what is the latest data on HMA therapy in high-risk MDS? So as we alluded to uh, the Aztex drug uh, even earlier, so this is the oral option that we have, and this is data from the Acertin study where we saw that oral Dacogen and sedazuridin is comparable when you look at uh, the um, sort of the pharmacokinetics, etc., in high-risk MDS. And if you look at median overall survival, especially in the more high-risk patients, like the one that we just spoke about with a biallelic TP53 mutation, the survival definitely exceeds that what was described in previous historical controls, so 13 months versus 8.4 months. And then if you look at monoallelic versus biallelic, the median survival for the monoallelic patients is even better, is about 30 months. So I would definitely consider using this drug for more high-risk patients. It's also an oral therapeutic option, so this is something that has appealed to several patients in clinic that you know don't want to keep coming in every week for injectable treatment, with the caveat being you still have to monitor their blood counts closely through the treatment. What other options do we have? So to start off with, I will say that there is room for cautious optimism. As Dr. Charles had alluded to, the last two years we saw some disappointments like with the APR246, uh, the large megrolimab azacitidine study, which we were specifically hoping would offer uh, therapeutic options to patients with TP53 mutations as they seem to be working better in these cohorts. But unfortunately, the uh, final readouts were disappointing for these studies. But we do have newer options. So one of these is sabatolimab. Sabatolimab can be considered a type of immune myeloid therapy, so this is something new for the field of MDS, 
and it specifically binds and blocks a receptor TIM3. And a TIM3 is uh, present and highly expressed on leukemic stem cells, preferentially compared to normal stem cells. And one of the things that sabatolimab is able to do mechanistically is to bind, block this binding of the TIM3 to galactin-9. And this prevents the leukemic stem cells from self-renewing, which is an important reason why patients relapse. And by blocking TIM3 on the immune cells, like the T cells, etc., as well, it actually enhances the sort of killing function by increasing like uh, cytokine interferon secretion uh, and just enhancing the antibody dependent cellular phagocytosis carried out by the macrophages. So this is a promising therapy which has now moved into the clinic and clinical trials. So the publication just came out like three days ago in Lancet and this is from the slides that was presented at ASH last year. So Sabatolimab in combination with HMA uh, has been uh, well tolerated overall with an adverse event response rate of roughly about 20%. If you look at it in head to head with HMA, I don't think it's that much worse. You know, I mean, you see sort of, uh, you know, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, etc. And the adverse effect profile is actually well tolerated. There are no specific immune-related adverse events that were noted with sabatolimab. Um, and in this, the phase two that was reported recently, although the primary endpoint of the study was actually not met, one of the things that was very interesting is that for patients that obtained a benefit from the therapy or responded to the therapy, there was a long duration of response and a delayed onset progression-free survival is something that is possible with sabatolimab. So if you look at the graph there on the right side, the progression-free survival was about 11 months compared to placebo and HMA of 8.5 months. And uh, uh, this is something that, you know, is if you look at the publication, it becomes more clear that some patients had a delayed uh, you had a long duration of response to the therapy overall. So in, in if you look at a sort of subgroup analysis of these patients, it does look like it has benefit potentially in higher risk setting, including those with TP53 mutant MDS. If you look at the progression-free survival of mutant TP53, it appears it is better in the sabatolimab plus HMA arm compared to the placebo uh, and, uh, you know, here in the unmutated TP53 as well, the curves actually do separate a little more at a later time point, just again stressing that there is a delayed onset kind of PFS benefit with the drug. This is a kind of interesting personally to me because this is one of the first trials which is incorporating MRD uh, in MDS. So MRD is a very crucial a clinical parameter monitored in other hematologic malignancies like ALL and now increasingly more in AML. But now in MDS, what we actually see as part of the stimulus trial is that higher um, NGS concordance was there, first of all, between peripheral blood mononuclear cells as well as bone marrow mononuclear cells in on-treatment samples. So this is a good thing. This means we don't always need to do a bone marrow to monitor MRD. We can actually look at the peripheral blood to see do the patients have MRD or not and monitor clonally. And uh, while in remission, more patients treated with sabatolimab and HMA reached MRD negativity. This could potentially explain why there was a longer duration of response and this delayed progression-free survival in sabatolimab-treated patients. And this finding is going to be further explored uh, as the MRD and NGS is incorporated into the ongoing phase three stimulus study. I also want to put in a little plug because we did, we have a poster here at ASH where we did a combined study with our center, Mount Sinai and University of Miami, just assessing MRD uh, by NGS in MDS pre and post transplant and we did find that, you know, MRD negativity correlated with the response to transplant very well. This will be presented by Dr. Shivani Handa, 
later in the meeting. So this is the design of the phase three stimulus uh, study of sabatolimab. So as you can see here, we will be incorporating patients with uh, IPSSR intermediate high, very high risk, MDS or CMML, those that are ineligible for intensive chemo or hematopoietic stem cell transplant and do have an indication for treatment with HMAs. There are various exclusion criteria which totally make sense, so no prior immune therapies, etc. And the primary endpoint of the study will be assessing overall survival. Patients will be randomized uh, to receive sabatolimab, IV 800 milligrams on day 8, along with azacitidine at standard doses versus a placebo and HMA. And 28-day cycles will be assessing the treatment. Another mechanism of action is really BCL2 inhibition. And after the success of the VLEA study and the approval of venetoclax in AML, we are increasingly looking towards venetoclax as being incorporated into the therapy of high-risk MDS. Uh, so just briefly to review the mechanism a little bit, so BCL2 is an important anti-apoptotic inhibitor which is more highly expressed in leukemic stem cells compared to normal stem cells and it binds the apoptotic activators BAX and BAT and when BCL2 is blocked you know BAX is free and it to initiate a massive apoptosis cascade that you see and when uh, venetoclax is used as a single agent it has minimal efficacy but in combination with azacitidine there is a lot more induction of apoptosis and put at a synergy because they are targeting different anti-apoptotic inhibitors. Venetoclax is primarily just targeting BCL2, whereas azacitidine is also targeting MCL1, which gets upregulated in the setting of venetoclax resistance. So this is the uh, st uh, earlier studies, just looking at uh, early phase studies, looking at venetoclax and HMA in high-risk MDS. Uh, so you can see, actually, it looks to be highly efficacious. So the overall response rates of HMA plus venetoclax are 77% compared to 40% alone with HMA. And the CR rates are about 34%. So these are all uh, significant and if you look at the more high-risk diseases that we have in MDS, like ASXL1 mutant or TP53 mutated patients, here too you do see a very good overall response rate of 87% respectively and 75% uh, in ASXL and TP53. The median overall survival uh, and uh, rate to AML transformation are things that, uh, you know, are a little bit difficult to assess in early phase studies. So I think that it would probably be best to look at the data coming out from the phase three study to assess this more. And then the allo stem cell transplant, we can bridge patients more successfully with these therapies to the ultimate curative treatment, which is allo stem cell transplant. So this is the design of the Verona study, which is accrued, and hopefully we will have a readout of this study soon. And 500 patients that were newly diagnosed with high-risk MDS were randomized to venetoclax, uh, given at a dose of 400 milligrams daily, day 1 to 14, plus azacitidine at standard doses versus placebo and azacitidine. Uh, the patients were stratified by IPSSR, transplant eligibility, and geographic regional differences. The dual endpoints are really complete response rates and overall survival. Uh, the one caveat I really want to put out there is although we don't know the readout of the study yet, is what is going to become crucial in MDS is how much venetoclax can our patients really tolerate. So really adhering to the guidelines and also clinically assessing the patients for dose modification of venetoclax is very important in the clinic and holding the drug when needed when they are in like a CRI and need to have some marrow recovery. So this is something we will be looking towards more and more. I want to highlight some work that is being done at my institution at Montefiore Einstein, and this is work done by Dr. Goldfinger 
and we thought okay so we have two successful drugs which is venetoclax and uh, hma like dacogen can we modify this backbone further to allow better tolerability and uh, increase uptake of this treatment in high risk mds so here we in this particular phase 2 study patients age over 18 with a diagnosis of either aml mds MDS MPN overlap syndromes not fit for intensive chemotherapy were given treatment in 28 day cycle but just weekly dosing so almost like a metronomic type of therapy of venetoclax 400 milligrams and dacogen 0.2 mg per kg subcutaneously on the same days and at this point this is some data that is also going to be presented at ASH on Monday uh, and at uh, the end of this induction, what we have reported in 20 patients is that the overall response rate was 71%, and 57% of the patients achieved a CR. And uh, what you will see is of this cohort, five patients were TP53 mutated, and four of them actually achieved a CR. So this is kind of promising. We can consider that there is increased chromosomal fragility in patients with TP53. So potentially is less more in this setting. Maybe you give them less chemo and, you know, bridge them to transplant that way. So this is a avenue we are exploring further. Another point I want to make is that if you look at the race breakdown, uh, we have really good accrual of black or African-American patients Spanish, Hispanic, Latino patients. This is really a real-world uh, scenario in which patients are being accrued on study. Some other new directions that are ongoing studies are, so this is the uh, targeting RARA overexpression in MDS. So about 20% of patients would have a RARA overexpression. And the select MDS1 study is assessing the tamibarotene or the RARA agonist in a double-blind placebo-controlled study. Uh, and in this study, which is accruing in several countries, actually, you know, patients are randomized in a two-is-to-one design between azacitidine and tamibarotene versus azacitidine and placebo. And we're looking at a CR uh, as a primary endpoint and some other secondary endpoints. XPO1, so this is a drug uh, uh, called Eltanexor, and this is a, a very different mechanism where there is targeting nuclear export of specific proteins, um, and uh, by inhibiting this kind of nuclear export, uh, there is uh, potential for inducing more cell death and apoptosis, um, uh, and uh, this is a drug which is also being explored in early phase studies right now in MDS called Eltanexor. So it has been assessed in a phase two study where uh, 10 milligrams of Eltanexor were given and uh, to look at the overall response rate as the primary objective. And again, this is mainly high risk patients. So those with a blast count of five to 19%, intermediate high or very high risk MDS, relapse refractory MDS as well, and, you know, good ECOG performance status. So what has been reported so far is that there is a promising overall response rate of Eltanexor. Uh, of, uh, if you look at the molecular CR plus uh, transfusion or the uh, independence, the overall response rates are about 26% in the ITT population. Uh, and uh, some amount of pay good amount have achieved stable disease, 43%. Uh, and then, you know, in early phase studies, as I said, it's a little bit hard you, to assess overall survival when there's no comparator arm. So <laughs> not sure how much stock to put into that. Uh, and overall appears to be quite a safe drug. The most common side effects were really, um, you know, just fatigue, asthenia, diarrhea, nausea, which are limited to grade one and two and typically manageable uh, in a clinical setting and not really very uh, immune, uh, pan causing myelosuppression, etc. So I think we will have to see that whether do other combinatorial approaches work better with this drug or is it going to move forward mainly as a single agent. Uh, so just for some take-home points now for high-risk MDS, I want to reiterate again that there's cautious optimism uh, in this field, and I think we can definitely do more for these patients in the clinic. 
uh, and also with drug development. And so for patients with high-risk MDS, clinical trials really should be prioritized, uh, particularly when it is challenging to access hematopoietic stem cell transplant or when you really want to bridge your patient to a stem cell transplant. There are lots of mechanisms of action that are currently being explored in the clinic that appear to be promising in high-risk MDS, such as TIM3 inhibition, BCL2 inhibition with venetoclax, XPO1, RARA agonism. And these are options that represent clinical trials that you could, if you, you could look at clinicaltrials.gov and find the closest center close to you, potentially to refer these patients to. And uh, the HMA therapy is a time-tested, you know, and it's really still doing great in an oral form with the oral decitabine and sedazuridin, which it continues to be a good option to offer patients a great oral option in high-risk MDS. Um, I think with this, I am going to close out my session. I thank everybody for their time and attendance and Please feel free to approach us afterwards with any questions, and I will uh, pass it on to Dr. D.S. Campello to close us out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sastri and Sally, for the great presentation. We move for, for the Q&A uh, session. We have at least 10 minutes, and we have a lot of questions. Uh, I think we can start with this uh, for any of you. How accurate have you found the IPSSM to be in your practice? Are you capturing more higher or more lower risk patients? Sure. I, I, we use this pretty much every day. Um, and nothing, it's basically just affirming our, our practice for really the last 10 years. I mean, IPSSM didn't really re it. it We've had a number of studies which have shown that we know certain high-risk lesions associated with worse survival, independently associated, whether it's P53, SX01, U2F1. Uh, so, and it's been validated in a number of subsets across uh, different populations. IPSSR is really the main comparator. Um, so mostly we are upstaging patients. That's why I think in my, in my situation, I, much of the use. Um, now it's not uncommon that we do downstage patients, <clears throat> But in my practice, probably that's a patient I would be following a bit more closely with regards to, you know, blood work and maybe reappraising NGS along the way. Okay. Another question in this direction. In your opinion, should NGS assessment should be tested uh, in a well routine in baseline, at baseline? Yes, absolutely. So I would highly recommend that, you know, NGS or genomic profiling should be incorporated at the baseline and not just at the baseline, every time you're doing a disease assessment, you know, if you are able to get a genomic profiling NGS done, uh, that is highly recommended. Uh, that being said, I do recognize that, you know, this is a global audience and not everybody has access like that to NGS testing uh, with a huge panel. But you may have even more limited panels available that are testing, you know, the most High, uh, highly occurring mutations in a specific disease and would highly encourage using even those if you have those available to you. I'd like to just emphasize Dr. Shastri's point that the number of variants that are being kind of assessed is, appears to be critical, especially for, you know, when insurance has a, a say in this. I, I've had a number of patients that have had to pay a bill despite, you know, my, you know, my attest and peer-to-peer -peer review, et cetera. Um, if you're just looking at things that are targetable or are really, really informing uh, the disease risk and the decision to go to transplantation, that's what should be prioritized. These larger panels, which are certainly available at many institutions, ourselves included, are sometimes not reimbursed. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I have another question regarding treatment. Uh, how qu quickly do, should we expect responses to the starting dose of Luspaterse? And when should we start titrating up? Any difference in timing in those adjustments in first and second line treatment? Uh, regarding this, I think uh, um, we have to start uh, at the initial dose and we have to wait at least two doses uh, to uh, check again hemoglobin level and if the hemoglobin level did not uh, increase and also the transfusion requirements and that are the same, you need to increase the dose. It's the same for the common trial and also the medalist trial. You can increase the dose up to 133 milligrams per kilo. And again, after two doses, again, if the patient did, is not in transfusion independency uh, and, of course, not presenting adverse events, you can again 
increase the dose and at least uh, for another two more cycles or three at the at the b uh, highest dose. It's the same in the both clinical trial. And I have a comment on it because in Europe we have no, currently a clinical trial called Luz Plus in which we start in the higher dose level. We started all patients in the 1.75 milligrams per kilo, trying to increase uh, the, the time, uh, de decrease the time to response, and after that, adequate the dose level if, if needs. And, and it's a clinical trial ongoing. We are recruiting nowadays, but probably it's, uh, I think, the same idea like in ESA. Usually in Spain, we, sta we started with the highest dose of ESA, why not in uh, LUSPA? And after that, decrease if the patient is in, in response. There is another uh, comment regarding uh, the experience of uh, panelists addressing myelosuppression with imetalstat. Lower reset it. Do you have this drug on treatment in uh, clinical trial? So we, yeah, so we actually, uh, no, we don't actually have experience with imetalstat uh, at our institution for MDS. I will say, though, this agent is not new. It has been tested in other diseases, too, like myeloproliferative neoplasms. So we are aware of the treatment-associated myelosuppression that occurs with the disease. Uh, I think, you know, just close monitoring and transfusion support as needed is the way to get through the therapy. Uh, we don't at this point have uh, any guideline on dosage reductions or spacing out, etc. So that's something we will have to see as the regulatory process evolves for IMETL-STAT. But the good news is that it is a short-lived period of myelosuppression and there is recovery in three to four weeks. So just aggressively supporting the patient. I think also reinforcing, you know, while you're having your discussion with the patient that this is, as we showed in the slide, a potentially disease modifying agent that this could affect the adverse trajectory of the disease more favorably may allow us to kind of, you know, just power through and, you know, improve adherence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in, in my center, I have the opportunity to to, to treat at least 15 patients, I think, okay. and the majority of them uh, develop uh, some, in sometimes uh, adverse events related to neutropenia and thrombocytopenia. And even that it uh, was uh, grade three or uh, four, uh, we didn't uh, 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 we didn't uh, identify any infection, any uh, bleeding. So I always uh, comment on it that this is only a numerical uh, uh, adverse event because it's not tra translated in clinical consequences. And you can to wait until uh, four weeks, the majority of the recovery with no uh, clinical consequences. And after that, you can uh, in, uh, treat again the patient according to the, to the dose uh, modification. But I think that uh, the, the very good point is not like a hypomethylating agent is not uh, inducing neutropenia or bleedings, and it's safe, of, of course, for the, for the patients. Well, another um, treatment, uh, another question also regarding lower risk tra uh, treatment. Do you, uh, do you recommend it, thromboprophylaxis, where you are giving lenalidomide in lower risk setting? This, this is a common question that, that patients ask us when they do their Googling and they come across mostly the plasma cell dyscrasia or myeloma literature for which, you know, there is an appreciable risk of, of VTE. Uh, it doesn't appear to be the case in MDS. Um, and most of our patients, you know, as you might, you know, be aware, you know, at some point encounter things like thromocytopenia, which get them off of any sort of uh, antiplatelet therapy anyway. This is not my practice. Uh, and unless there's another indication for primary prophylaxis for coronary disease or something like that, uh, I, I don't offer this, no. Okay, another question uh, in the high-risk uh, setting. How many cycles of hypomethylating agent before Joe marrow this patient to evaluate for remission? Yeah, so for patients in the high-risk setting, you know, so I would say at least three to four cycles of if you're doing just pure hypomethylating agents before you evaluate for disease response. I've even had uh, patients in my practice who had an even later response, but a sustained response to hypomethylating agents. So they definitely need adequate time. I would say 
at least in my practice, I don't completely give up before I do at least four to six cycles of therapy and, you know, support them with transfusions as needed. Yeah. Okay. And two last questions. Uh, does Tamivarotene work by inducing differentiation via RERA? You know, the mechanism of action of Tamivarotene? Oh, that's a good point. Uh, I guess... Yeah, I, I mean, it, the mechanisms to to what I know is really that there is RARA overexpression mm -hmm. in certain subtypes of MDS. And uh, this particular drug is able to block this sort of RARA overexpression and allows a differentiation. So potentially a differentiating agent in combination with azacitidine and may have efficacy in the more high risk uh, also pathologic, um, you know, s s categories of patients who have more like blasts, more monocytosis, etc. So that's what is the mechanism of action that we are aware of. Yeah. Okay. And the last uh, question. There are several ones, but we don't have in this <laughs> enough time. Uh, uh, what is the impact of bone marrow fibrosis on the responses of Luspatose? Uh, I'm happy to admit I actually don't know. I'm across other sort of treatment uh, treatments that are available, it can. Um, in all honesty, it gets hard to actually qualify responses when you're looking at like MF3 of 3 within a bone marrow. Um, but I, I'm fully unaware of how that uh, associates with LUSPA. Yes. And, and of course, there is been, this drug is also be, been tested in patients with myofibrosis, so probably it's an um, it's, uh, uh, effective drug also in this, in this context. Can I ask my fellow panelists a question, actually? I was curious. There is a report from Moffitt Cancer Center about potentially combining EPO and Luspatercept, given that EPO works on the earlier stage of erythropoiesis and Luspatercept on terminal erythroid differentiation. So is this something that uh, you have done, or would you consider in the, put in the future potentially combining these two agents to... Or this, this could be the great idea, I think, yeah. because yeah. both are uh, acting synergically. But I think that we need to move for a clinical trial yes. uh, because we don't know probably the sequence and the, the doses. And I think this is a very good idea uh, because the both uh, drugs are with a very good safety profile with no relevant adverse event and are subcutaneously administrating. So, the, this is the, 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 the best combination, I think, for initial uh, treatment, but we need to move uh, based on clinical trial. I think there are some experience published uh, here in us meeting last year, but I think the way to, uh, co uh, uh, to address this uh, question is with a, a formal clinical trial. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I agree. But I, of course, it's, it's the, the new step. Yep. Also, uh, Luz Patterson, for example, I think this, it, it could be a very good partner for other treatments in the lower resetting due to the to, due to the safety profile in metal stat also lenalidomide why not so probably we need to increase uh, the responses to this drug because the long trip of the lower risk uh, patient is is, is too prolonged uh, they are a lot of periods of transfusion dependency and we need to to reach uh, more treatments for uh, for try to to not transfuse the patient yeah and that's all. I'd like to thank my co-panelists uh, and, of course, thank you to you, all of you for joining us and uh, uh, have a very good promising as uh, meeting and also a Friday symposium uh, today. Thank you very much. This activity is certified by Penn State College of Medicine. This activity is developed in collaboration with our educational partner, PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Remember to download the slides and practice aids.